Hello and welcome to the AgriGrand Podcast. I'm Rob, I'm with Royce, and today I'm with Ian. Welcome, Ian. You're our first guest on this episode, so it's really cool uh, that you're here today. Uh, do you want to give a little background about yourself? Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name's Ian. I started Garden State Composting with my partner, Katie. Um, we're basically composting and picking up compost around the uh, South New Jersey area, Camden County. Awesome. And what's your business called again? Garden State Composting. Garden State. Great. Well, I think I want to start a little bit by talking about um, how composting works and maybe the procedure of it. So I'll start a little by saying my take on it. I see composting as a way that you take, I guess, uh, how I wanted to do it was taking leftover materials, say my kitchen scraps, and uh, you take it and you take those scraps and you pile them outside and those would be considered your greens and if I'm not mistaken that is where your nitrogen comes from and uh, you then pile um, your browns or more carbon materials and together that whole process just makes this little I guess environment for microbial life to thrive and break down organic materials and um, be ready to be added to make your own soil a better mm -hmm. environment as well. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you're right on track there. It's, it's definitely something that, um, you know, happens naturally. Like we think about the natural world around us and this is a process that has always occurred throughout nature is just the breakdown of, of organic matter. And um, yeah, I mean, in terms of like our uh, compost itself, I mean, yeah, it's basically adding organic matter and, um, you know, just keeping the process going, feeding it. You know, something that I really think is neat about the composting process that humans do versus the way nature does it. And I often wonder about what the actual difference is, but humans, I think, are making compost and like we, we kind of bring together all these materials and make a really big mass out of it. And our compost heats up. Um, I don't know if that happens like in nature ever. Um, with nature, right? Suppose like a piece of fruit falls off a tree and becomes decomposed like on the ground. Um, I often wonder like, is that process sort of like the human composting way? And like, how is that kind of different? Are there like the same microorganisms involved? And what's like the end point there? Is it the same as like the way humans do it? So maybe I'll, I'll kind of throw that your way to see what your take is on that, Ian. Yeah, you're right. I, I don't think that um, nature is capable of making compost the same way that we do. Um, our inputs and our methods definitely contribute to, a, you know, a higher heat pile, something that breaks down quicker. You know, just like you said, like, uh, nature doesn't quite do it as quickly for one. I mean, if you have fall just passed and we're still seeing leaves on the ground, right? So if humans can do a quick turnaround with compost in a matter of two weeks and nature can't really do it at the same pace, I mean... We do have a unique way about it, truthfully. You know, Ian, maybe nature made you so that it can make compost faster. <laughs> yeah. I like to think yeah, about it that so. way, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe so. I mean, they, they def nature definitely needed us for something, I think. So, Ian, have you ever made compost tea? I have not personally made compost tea, but... Um, I know some things about it, yeah. Cool. Do you want to explain a little about what you know, and you too, Royce, um, in terms of like, I guess for me, so I'm more of a beginner uh, gardener, and how I see it, I see it, I'm currently making compost outside, and I've never made compost tea. 
And I know that um, it's a liquid, and it's supposed to extract all the, uh, I guess, um, micro microbes and every all the good things from the compost go in that liquid. And is it almost like a foliar application where you put on your plants or in the soil? It could be. Uh, it does certainly make it a little easier to apply, like uh, I would say precisely. Um, but yeah, I think compost tea is, is a really nice way to break it down and make like a really rich, uh, high nutrient product that you can really, like you said, kind of get it right into the roots or really apply it sort of precisely. I think it's important for probably farmers too, even more to have some kind of liquid product because from what I understand, not that I'm a farmer or anything, but the machinery that they have available, they can load up their compost tea in some kind of machine and, and kind of inject it into the ground wherever they would like it, suppose where they you know plant a seed or, or, or something like that. Um, so getting like those microbial species where they have to go, I think might be cost prohibitive if it was like a solid compost product, but it might be a little bit easier if it's in the uh, solution. <laughs> so I want to peel off a little bit to, I guess, more of the logistics in terms of collecting the compost from people's houses and taking it to the farmer. Um, the first question that comes to mind, Ian, is how do you see... Mm -hmm. Like, what are the most, like, uh, inefficient, or what are the inefficiencies or the problems that you see in terms of, like, the supply chain? Uh, <clears throat> uh, yeah, right now, I mean, my biggest thing is uh, I kind of wish I had an electric truck. I mean, that's one thing to think about is I'm traveling all over Camden County to pick up, so I actually am putting out a lot of CO2 and emissions, if you think about it, so... Um, and again, I have to transport things to media PA. So that is also like, you know, back and forth, probably about 50 miles altogether. So quite a few emissions. I would say that's really the most inefficient thing about it is that in order to go around and collect from everybody, I do have a somewhat fuel efficient truck, but that's only saying like 20 miles per gallon. That's still not very good. So um, yeah, it's, it's the fossil fuel consumption, it's the emissions that kind of contributes to an inefficient system right now. Um, and also, you know, there's, these neighborhoods are spread out, you know, this is not quite to the level where everybody in one neighborhood gets it. The highest, uh, density I would say is Collingswood. So, um, yeah, at this point you're kind of traveling all around and that can create some inefficiencies for sure. And it's, it's a little um, unpleasant to think about, but you know, yeah. at the same time, I think the main point is trying to limit the methane emissions. So the CO2 emissions are bad and that is an inefficient thing, but ultimately what I do, I, I hope <laughs> is serving a good purpose. You know you're what I balancing mean? yourself out. <laughs> yeah. Um. I hope so. I, I hope so. so. I, ho I hope it's actually doing more good than, you know, just balancing it out. So I believe yeah. it is. Um, so when you're picking up these uh, compost piles, I know that you uh, give people a bin that they put out. Um, they can do every biweekly and monthly. And right. you come, you pick it up, uh, whatever their plan is. And do you like, do you have to, when you're picking it up, kind of give like a little glance about like what really is in their bin? Um, if they have, I know you were mentioning before that you think uh, you had an opinion on the compostable straws and plastics um, that you see. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Right. right. Yeah, I mean, we have specific yeah. guidelines that we give people and um, to, to a degree, people are pretty good at following it. Um, but, you know, you do have mistakes and you do have people that like, like an example is recyclables. People mess up with their recycling all the time and they're still trying to learn certain rules. Like every once in a while, you know, you'll have something come up with recycling where you're like, oh, does this go in the recycling or does this go in trash? Mm -hmm. And um, it's the same thing with composting so far. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely have 
times where I have looked in somebody's bin and been like, oh, no, I mean, the worst of it was probably one time I had somebody put a full uh, chicken in there, like a oh, roast rotisserie no. chicken they, they put in the bin. Yeah, so uh, that was unpleasant. And, you know, I, I can't let that go to the facility because, you know, it, it can cause, you know, possibly disease trans transmission, but more so odor and, you know, rats, things like that. Um, and the pile is pretty healthy itself. So some of that stuff is not so much a concern. It's, but, you know, yeah, people do mess up and I really have to like kind of look into things and see if they're doing it right. Just like, uh, say, a recycling facility would. <laughs> Do That's you? Uh, sorry, go ahead, Royce. No. Um. So I was just wondering, what happens to people's uh, compostable products once they go into the compost pile? Do they kind of want the compost back, like so they could put it in the garden, or are they cool with it just kind of, you know, going to whoever is going to use it? So far, people really want it back. <laughs> um, a lot of people have uh kind of you know reached out and said hey i would like to get the end product back how are you know are you um able to do that and as of right now i'm still working on it logistically you know like i said i want to make sure i'm doing things efficiently and um not creating more emissions than i'm really saving so i'm trying to figure out a way logistically to get it back to people in a way that makes sense um the farm that i work with does indeed sell the compost back and I have a deal with them to get it back but as of right now I'm just still trying to you know tweak the logistics and get it back to people but to answer your question yeah they they definitely want it back and people who have gardens or have something going on definitely want it and even people who don't you know people who aren't subscribed to our service are reaching out to us and saying hey we would like to see if you have any product available oh. It sounds like a really key component of your business, at least the way that you're running it, is, you know, am I actually benefiting society? And I just think that's a, that's a really honorable thing to keep in mind. Not just, you know, do I have the product that I can sell to people and how do I get that the cheapest? But you're, you're thinking, you know, how can I be efficient in terms of, you know, reducing my own footprint, which is really neat. Um, I just wonder how things might turn out in our society if uh, more people thought that way. So I want to say, do you think people in like the ag space or especially like um, the regenerative agriculture space, like I feel like people genuinely like more people have that mindset uh, from my experience and that the community is very unique in the way that um, people like, like there's like the understanding of this is the world and uh we all have our part in it to um, not necessarily make it better, but at least at least maintain it, right? Um, especially with all the mm -hmm. knowledge that uh, we have today and all the science that backs up everything. Um, so I actually right. want to talk about a little bit about uh, how you see the government in terms of policies. What do you think that they should be doing better, um, especially for the compost pickup service um, sector because I think that compost pickup uh, I'm sorry the compost pickup service is um, an mm -hmm. amazing service and there's lots of opportunity there and the government should take it more seriously definitely um, I think you know ultimate goal I always say is kind of getting this program set up to a point where municipalities do it um, which is definitely possible and it's done in some places i know it's done in other countries you know i've actually spoken to someone it was kind of eye-opening when i was talking to somebody from ireland and they said oh this is just how we do it you know we have a separate compost pickup it's not this doesn't go in the trash and so there is a disconnect here in the u.s of course you know we just tend to like throw things in the trash and we've all lumped it into one category and mm. going back to recycling that's you know something that branched off thank god we we decided hey we need to recycle things so i think um, still 
um, the recycling is still an issue, though, where I've heard that uh, most of what you recycle anyway doesn't even get recycled. Um, partly because a Definitely. lot of it is contaminated. It's hard to realize what's contaminated. But I think specifically yeah. for this compost um, servicing sector, that the opportunity to reuse waste is a lot more viable than, say, recycling a computer part. Because then you really have to get down to the, um, like, the real, like, almost nanoscience of how do I break apart, like, this metal material and make it reusable. Whereas the composting, it's a natural process that's already been done. Humans don't have to make it up. We don't have to invent anything. We just let nature take right. nature's course. And, um... Right. I know what you mean, though. I remember. Uh, oh no! What was the pot? What was the video? There's a there's great documentaries everywhere, and one of them has uh, mentions how I think it was in South Korea that they have a very strict compost policy, where if you throw mm -hmm. your kitchen scraps in the non compost, um, you get like penalties for it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Whether it's a fine, I forget exactly how. But um, so, do you think that, and Royce too, do you think that foreign countries from America <clears throat> have better policies in terms of um, regenerative practices? What do you think, Ian? I mean, you were saying about I, I certainly, yeah, I, I certainly do. I. I really think that America has kind of uh, lagged behind on this and um, we're not, we're definitely not handling trash the right way. And trash is something totally separate from compost. And I think you make a really good point, Rob, in saying that I think compost has the ability to make a bigger impact than recycling has because recycling, you know, truth be told is broken. Uh, <laughs> You know, you made some good points there. It's just, it's kind of broken in a lot of ways. So, but composting is something that is semi easy to do. I mean, it does require some startup. I mean, for, in terms of doing it large scale, but anybody can do it in their backyard if they have one. Um, things are coming out where you can do it on your countertop and it has the potential to do great things. So make big impacts. So I think for certain, you know, the U.S. is lagging behind on that, and I think really what needs to happen is the you know localities and municipalities need to um, you know basically sort of start pushing people to do it. I definitely agree. Now, what do you think about new compost technology? So, for instance, I was seeing a window turner is what it's called and it's pretty mm -hmm. much a um oh no now i'm blanking on the name but you know those big ice skating uh machines the um what's it, it starts with the j anyway the zamboni oh the zamboni not with the j yeah the zambonis zambonis it's kind of like yeah those, except <laughs> yeah it's for compost and it, you like drive it and it turns all the compost i'm pretty sure i um for the video i'll wow. pull it up an image um, I could show you guys one too later, but um, yeah, it's pretty funny. And uh, but it just goes to show you mm -hmm. that like there's still a lot of innovation going on. And do you have any like particular I guess tools that you've seen um, that help you with either your job or anything uh, particular that you have in mind in just the regen space? Yeah, um, I've been seeing like a startup product. I think um, do you know Pella? like the pellet cases that are like, I don't know if I'm saying that right. They're the compostable um, phone cases. Phone Have cases? you heard of those? Yeah, I've compostable phone before. cases. I've not heard of those either, no. <clears throat> so I've actually had a few of them, but they're compostable uh, phone cases. And um, this company, it's called Pella, P-E-L-A. I think I'm saying that right. And they have like, actually started this uh, little countertop com composter called a Lomi. And um, it's pretty cool. And apparently it makes compost within hours or maybe a day or two. It's, oh, wow. it's pretty intense. I don't 
really understand the technology behind it myself, but because uh, it has to function as a phone of... case too. <laughs> <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> does your phone yeah, talk, Rob? Yeah, I mean, it does. <laughs> Um, so that, yeah. I wanna, it's a neat product. Um, I'm just here looking at that right now on the internet. The like the actual phone case looks really neat. It kind of looks like it's recycled. The phone cases are, yeah, yeah. The phone cases are really nice. I like them. I, I suggest everyone get them who can. You know, it's it's one more thing that you can compost. So I want to now take a quick segment into showing what is in compost. Um, this is from my backyard. Um, for my little compost pile. Mm -hmm. So this is your your compost that you're making in your you know compost turner. Yes. So I have a compost turner. I made compost out of wood pellets and alfalfa meal and some wheat. This was suggested by Royce, and I have been. It's going pretty well. Um, there's. I think mm -hmm. in terms of abundance and quantity, I need maybe have to add a little bit more because the process is still colder. But this is really cool. So right. this is inside um, the bin. And when I was exploring this before, I was I noticed that there was a lot of nematodes. They are little like worm-like microorganisms. If you see there, oh. um, that's probably a sleeping one or a dead one. Um, but oh, man, I, wow. I was hoping that they would be a, really alive in here but, wow okay so, so if you go back like leftwards i saw there was a couple kind of structures there hanging out what are those things this yeah is that a fungus or is that a nematode den a nematode den i don't know if they have <laughs> dens um yeah so i'm still learning as well i don't think that this is anything I would actually have to like here. Let me look inside because the video quality is a little worse than actually the microscope. I think I see movement inside there. Okay, so that is just I think a piece of leaf because I look in the microscope and it's much more green than um. Oh, okay. I try to... So that's but what you see here. I'll explain a little of what I know. Oh, yeah, as you see there, that is a nematode, but again, it might be dead. Um, you got to take better care of your nematodes, Rob. I don't see anything <laughs> living in here. Now, that's looking right the audience sees, but that just single strand that you see in the middle of the screen, I'm pretty sure that's a fungal hyphae. So that's the first time I've seen fungal hyphae in this compost. And um, as uh, it goes, fungal seeing fungal hyphae in your soil uh, biology, so if you just went out and looked at your soil, um, if you see, I think Elaine Ingham mentions that you should have a 7 to 1 ratio of your fungal to bacteria um, in your soil. So mm -hmm. in the compost, though, you don't want to see too much fungal hyphae, from what I've heard. But it's always good to see. Um, so this is interesting. Okay, so I didn't yeah. get the nematodes yeah. that I was hoping for, but um, they're pretty cool. I will actually on the Agagran website or sorry YouTube channel, you will see a video of a nematode. It's about four minutes. There's also a short clip of it just squirming around doing its nematode thing. Um, from what I understand, they are they eat. Uh, bacteria and they also might eat protozoa and they eat each other there's multiple species of them um, mm -hmm. but uh, and like just to be clear like seeing these these things in compost or soil is actually a good thing good thing yeah yeah right? definitely so the more <laughs> biology you have um in your soil it's always good and uh in your compost uh, i try to do some research about it when i noticed oh my god there's a lot of nematodes um it is a good thing especially if you need nematodes and in my particular case from my yard uh i did not see many nematodes and um, nor fungal hyphae 
So those are two things that I feel like maybe I need to add more into my soil um, through various amendments. Uh, but yeah, so in compost, it is good to see nematodes. And um, you also don't mind seeing bacteria. Right. So this is kind of neat to think about what uh, compost tea is actually doing. It's like essentially what, what you're looking at here, Rob, is the compost tea, right? You kind of mixed up a little bit of water with your sample and you like took a drop out of it. Yeah, exactly. Um, that's exactly what I did. I got a little water drop from this little test tube. You put your compost in here, you fill it up. Um, there's a certain ratio you can do. And nice. you take a little pipette, you put it on a glass slide, and um, you're able to see this miracle world of microbes. These little yellowish parts, pretty sure they're bacterial aggregates. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I believe it can be considered humic acid. Um, always tell me if I'm wrong comments but yeah so i thought this was cool to show what, what do you take what what are you thinking now ian it's pretty cool to see i mean even in the uh still life of it you know without the nematodes um you know i love to see it it's it's cool it is i mean so interesting to know that there's all these just little microbes and all these small organisms just doing the work that's creating a product ultimately you know? yeah i mean it, it's a, it's absolutely amazing i think um i i think it's just incredible i mean it's like and the thing is is not many people know really what's going on like even the experts in the field seem to have a consensus that um they don't know i mean like any true scientist i guess but especially in this field. Um, it's so complex and there's so many things going on. I think if you take one teaspoon of soil, you have more uh, microbes or uh, species of microbes or maybe not species, I'm sorry, but you have more microbes than stars like, in the observable, excuse me, universe. Very cool. Thank you for that. Can I ask you a question yeah. that I thought might be kind of fun? So. Mm -hmm. What do you think of human composting? I think it's an interesting... I actually think it is interesting. I don't know, you know much about it, but I, from what I understand, um, like a long time ago, they actually would use humans as comp part of their compost piles. If you go back to the very early history of, like, uh, of composting. So I think it was um something like a practice that was done more before and i think it is a good thing i you know i would like to be that's i mean i would just kind of like to return to the earth in a sense yeah um it's a great thing to use you know most the like horse manure cow manure it's a great thing to use to add uh, nitrogen to your pile so um, if you're able to get that, it really speeds up the process. I mean, you don't want too much nitrogen, but you know, with all things, you need the balance. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm right there with that. I think that, unfortunately, I don't think it's very safe to, to do other types of composting with like animals like dogs. I think that has a high potential to spread disease um, as, sort of the process currently stands and but other than that like um animals that just graze are great for their manure and it is actually really good to add that to the compost because um again it's just a good it adds tons of nitrogen it's really it's the way that it was done pretty much throughout all time i think it's it's interesting to look at the manure from a ruminant animal like a horse or a cow and when you look at it it really just looks like a big ball of like you know kind of chewed up grass it kind of has like the grass already in it right it like it, it kind of looks like what it was when it went in there so right that's just kind of like i don't know kind of like a cow is just a, a big composter 
and it kind of <laughs> does it, it like doesn't finish the job all the way and so it just kind of does its thing and it's like a nice little pile of like pre-made like compost starter and so that that's much different from you know something like a predator you know defecating on the ground and you know much different bacterial whatever composition i think i recently moved to the area um from philly so i was living up in new hampshire and there was a big um service provider up there uh, it was called mr fox and it was all over the place you know residential commercial like they they picked up from a bunch of coffee shops in the area <clears throat> And then when I came back to Philly, there was, you know, a, a very similar thing in Bennett and Circle Compost. Um, they service, you know, the Philly area. So when I moved over here, I just didn't see anything available. Like I was actually trying to sign up for something and um, nothing was available. I, it just seemed like there was no service whatsoever. And that's, I guess, because there's certain laws in place um, that kind of prohibited people from doing it to a certain degree. But um, yeah, I, I just saw no service whatsoever. And I was like, well, I might as well do it because this needs to be done in this community. And, you know, it's, I wanted to be the one to start it. Uh, in Jersey, so for, in New Jersey, there's state laws in place and they may have been changed over the past few months, but as of last year, there was still laws in place that prohibited farmers from accepting food scraps from people. So that's kind of created this um, atmosphere around here where it's very hard in the state of New Jersey to find somebody that will accept uh, compost. So, um, that's kind of why you don't see a lot of service providers and you don't see a lot of people that are um, willing to accept it either. I that, that's really unfortunate that the laws kind of prevent farmers from connecting with people around them to get, you know, waste products, basically. Right. Um, I wonder if there was think... a reason for that initially, maybe there was some sort of problem, uh, but you know, sometimes the government's a little bit short-sighted in its laws and it casts a really wide net around, you know, some stuff it probably shouldn't. <laughs> right. That may have been the reasoning for it. I mean, there, I mean, there may have been some other reason that sort of ended up getting that uh, banned. But I know from speaking to people in the area that there used to be, you know, pig farmers, for example, that would come around and get food scraps from everybody, you know, back in the 60s, 70s. Um, and somehow that just ended up, you know, not not being the case anymore. Um, <laughs> and again, farmers can't, as of last year, you know, I, I don't I don't know if in January the, the law may have changed, but um, as of last year, it was still the case that farmers in New Jersey could not accept food scraps from from people so uh that kind of when i was trying to uh start the business it left me in a strange place because i was looking all over thinking who will accept this compost you know you i get a sense and i've been in agriculture so a lot of farmers just don't have the capabilities to do composting right they don't have the time for it so going down that alley was not um not really feasible. You ha really have to find somebody who specializes in it and is going to take the time and do it right. Because otherwise it's just a rotting putrefied pile on the ground, right? So um, I wanted to create a, a good product, you know, help create a good product and um, actually re-divert these resources to an end product. So um, that's just really hard to come by in Jersey. Uh, it's, it's kind of wild actually. And so, so you're 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 taking this compost to uh, Southern Pennsylvania, basically. Yeah, uh, Media PA over in Delaware County. Nice. And so that that area, from what I understand, is like kind of mushroom capital of the world, right? Southern Pennsylvania. Um. Yeah. Southern Chester County is uh, that down a little south of there, going more towards Maryland, is where the mushroom capital is. Yeah. 
Okay, nice. So that that industry definitely needs a lot of compost. Do you know if maybe like some of your, your compost gets funneled that way? Or do you think that that compost is kind of mushroom specific? <laughs> you know, I, I actually don't know. I, I think that would be a good avenue for the farm that I partner with to go down. Uh, honestly, now that you bring it up, the only people I know that individuals buy it, um, you know, if they have the, the means to pick it up, the farm that I partner with just doesn't deliver it. But Scott's is actually picking it up and coming and picking up, you know, large wholesale amounts. So, and then Scott's bags it and puts it under their name. They don't, you know, uh, but they would probably sell it in Home Depot and put like a local bag on it, like local compost. I've seen that. It's just bagged under the Scott's name. So how do you see, or I should first, I'm sorry, I want to ask, how big of an area, um, I guess specifically from your farmer, how big of an area do they use to compost all these scraps? Uh, pretty big area. Uh, if I had to estimate, it's actually spread over a few different areas of the farm because it's on a rotational basis. I think at least, at least uh, three acres is devoted to it. Oh, wow. If I had to give, you know, a, a kind of a broad guess, it would probably be at least three acres, which is a lot of space, but. It's a lot more know, than I imagine, yeah. Yeah, he needs space to spread the piles out. Um, you know, I was just there today and he was just, you know, divert, making smaller piles elsewhere. So he kind of needs space to sort of just branch out all the piles and do what he needs to do. You got to be able to work the piles and he needs really, he has large equipment too, you know? So yeah, he needs a lot of space devoted to it. Oh, wow. Do you think I could ask you about some gardening questions, Ian? Yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. So we talked uh, you know, kind of before the show and you mentioned that you were a gardener. I would just like to know, what was your first experience gardening? Uh, growing up, actually, I my mom stoked my early interest in gardening because growing up, she was always a gardener. So... Um, I would always help her whether it was, it was mainly her, her thing was like always roses and tomatoes, which is a funny combo, but that's what she did. And, uh, you know, she would have all the flowers and some simpler, I'll say veggies to do like tomatoes aren't very simple, but, um, you know, stuff like tomatoes and cucumbers. And, uh, I would always help her with that. So it's just kind of always stoked my interest in feels good to be out there and I always felt that growing up I just liked being outside and playing in the dirt a little bit that's, that's a awesome. great way to start gardening yeah I think that's how people have been learning how to garden for forever basically right since since the beginning of time right you have to pass down knowledge about gardening and things like that so yeah it's super important um, yeah exactly not enough people your... do it what is your, your favorite thing about gardening? And as like a follow-up, what's your, your least favorite thing about gardening too? Um, it's funny. I mean, in gardening, <laughs> I feel like they're both kind of the same thing. It's the little meditative stress release that you get from completing, you know, all these simple tasks, whether it be pruning, weeding, uh, some of the more like difficult tasks, I'll say, or more um, arduous tasks kind of end up being like meditative. And then it really just depends on what kind of mindset you're in. Because then on another day, I think weeding can be like, oh, my God, I hate this so much. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's it's I think my, my favorite thing about it is how meditative it can be. And you can kind of get that stress relief and you get to be outside and just enjoying these little um, bits of life that you have right in front of you. So, um, but then again, the, my least favorite thing would probably just be like the 
the same little things like weeding and and pruning that can actually be arduous at times. What a great way to say it. Do you have any tips for the at-home gardeners for saving um, their backs maybe a little while maintaining that meditative state <laughs> of gardening? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. I, I mean, use knee pads, I think. You know, just keep that back up, right? Use some knee pads. Um, there's a lot of people out there that just do things for hours. And like I was saying, you get really into it and you start kind of like being in your zone of like, oh, I'm in the garden. This is my happy place. And then later on, your body kind of reminds you. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, you were in that position for way too long. <laughs> so, yeah, people just try to be mindful of your of your back and what you're doing and um, how you're bending you know, what kind of weight you're putting on your knees. Really make sure you're saving your body. Ian, have you ever heard by chance of a guy named Masanobu Fukuoka in his book, The One Straw Revolution? Yeah, I read that actually. Really? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. What, so do you apply any, any um, of his principles to your own life? So basically his principle is do nothing farming or at least do less than you think you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely try to apply those principles to my life. I mean, um, I think they're really important principles, just not, not just for uh, farming, but for life. Uh, that's such a great book. I'm thinking about it. Um, <laughs> I was really struck uh, by myself. I, I really enjoy Masanobu's book. Uh, he's unfortunately passed away now, and the man mm -hmm. that, that I think translated the book into English or maybe helped translate it, Larry Korn, I think he actually passed away recently, maybe 2019 or 2018 or something like that, which is terrible because, you know, we have this podcast now, and oh my gosh, I would have loved to, you know, talk to, to someone associated with him, but Masanobu's oh, yeah. is actually still being run in Japan by his sons, I think, at least one of his sons. So, oh wow! Okay, that is pretty cool. So, it's good to know but, it still exists. Yeah, yeah. But like Masanobu's whole um, kind of take on it is like, maybe don't worry so much about the weeds, right? Like, don't uh, worry if there's something that like maybe looks out of place or things don't don't look perfect. You know, uh, maybe that's just like the ecosystem doing what it wants to do, and so maybe right. You don't have to spray chemicals on it or maybe you don't have to weed everything specifically so i thought that was cool and he also kind of says like um that his kind of do nothing farming is not actually do nothing it's just you know be like choosy with what you're actually doing don't don't waste a lot of energy and i think that could be translated to like a consumerist society like we have now right like maybe do you really need that that next you know fill in the blank uh you know think about the garbage you're gonna create think about all the problems you're gonna do here and uh you know so that could be applied to most any part of your life so definitely recommended on on my kind of you know book list of you know things that people should eventually read he does teach you about how to grow like winter wheat and like citrus fruit but besides those portions like the rest of the book can be applied to pretty much anything right <laughs> yes and oh I my know, gosh um... It's been given the thumbs up by uh, Gabe Brown. That's how I haven't read the book yet. It's on my um, next book list or my to read list. Uh, but I know mm -hmm. of it by Gabe Brown, and um, he praised the book a lot. So definitely give it a check out. Or check it out. So I wanted to say how we're, all this talk um, is something that I've been thinking about a lot recently, and that Agrigran um, believes firmly, and we want to promote is that gardening is in itself a lifestyle. It's a way, like you said, Ian, to relieve some stress, get into this like meditative kind of feel-good state. And it's something uniquely about gardening or growing that you get, say, from versus playing video games or watching television or maybe even just meditating itself. Uh, I mean, it's much more different, but meditation in itself is a lifestyle that people choose. 
Um, so again, my point is is that uh, we believe that yeah, gardening is um, a way almost like it's almost like a philosophy. Uh, would you agree with that or disagree? I agree. Yeah, I I do agree. I think um, it does have to be a way of life. Otherwise, I mean, uh, it's kind of funny because we were just talking about the do nothing and the sort of um, nature of that but there's it does have to be a way of life for you to sort of be successful with it right i mean with anything you have to spend time with it you have to cultivate it um so yeah if for certain is in it's it's a way of life i mean it has to be i would like to kind of follow up here also um okay so what if what if everyone put down their device and picked up a watering can and a garden rake, right? What are some of the first problems you think would be solved in our world? Probably a lot of the food insecurity, for one. I, I mean, if you have available land to do it and you're able to grow some of your own stuff, I think that it's, there's so much tension relief. I mean, I, I don't know. There's so many avenues I could go down. It's honestly, it would fix so many problems if people would just kind of like focus on the, on some of those, uh, on gardening and just get off of like social media and stuff like that. Um, that stuff is just so toxic and, and whatever, but, uh, yeah, man, people, so many issues could be solved. Honestly, I don't even know where to begin, but I think probably food, food insecurity would be, one of those things i mean think about if people were just doing some stuff on their rooftops in the city or something and um we're able to kind of like spread that food around there's just so many wasted so much wasted space so much wasted time um yeah we could we could all be growing a lot more food and be a lot more relaxed i think in this country for <laughs> sure i really love how the tomatoes that you can grow in your garden are so vastly different in flavor compared to the ones that you can get in the store and uh mm. man, like whenever you grow your own like your own first tomato like a real good one and you bite into it and you're like wow like this is actually sweet and it has like these little nuanced flavors and i think you maybe start to think to yourself hey what about everything else in the store is that the same as this tomato like <laughs> is the one that you can grow at home way better and you know it probably is um i was in washington probably five years ago and i decided that i wanted to go through um yakima valley where all the hops are grown pretty much for all the great ipas in the usa and man there was a farm stand over there and so in the same region they grow uh pretty much all like the cherries for like the cherry juice that we have here in the usa and everything but they had a farm stand there and man, they were selling cherries and apricots, like, directly off the farm. And I could not tell mm -hmm. you even how much different that was from basically anything in the store. And everyone that I talk to that, that's kind of traveled, that's into farming and stuff like that, they always tell me, like, these little stories that they had, you know, picking up great food at, at the farm stand. A buddy of mine went to Florida before he told me oranges from the florida farm stand were just insane he's like they're insanely sweet and he said he got a whole sack of these oranges thought they were the best in the entire world so he takes it down there to his buddy he's like look man you have to try the orange like the guy tried it and he's like yeah it's okay i've had better and that like blew his mind that there was even better oranges out there <laughs> oh man so like yeah. when you start to yeah. get into gardening right you start to realize like there's an amazing kind of produce to be had and i think masanobu talks about that in his book he said like during the different seasons like you can enjoy you know whatever's fresh in that season i guess there's like an inland sea by where uh masanobu's farm was and you can go collect like little things out of the ocean like ocean vegetables and whatnot and he said just appreciating that in, in the season so maybe that, that that's not really like a question, but kind of like a musing that I was kind of interested in is, uh, man, that'd be cool if we could all just kind of think about food that way. Think about life that way. So cool. Yeah. And food would be a lot more pleasure that way. Oh, yeah. 
sorry for the rant. I just think that's a, it's kind of a neat statement, though. So do you think that this all comes down to just there being a lack of education about how to grow food and the benefits of growing your own food and, um, I guess, the education of the gardening lifestyle? I think so. I, I mean, I grew up in a, you know, he heavily suburban area. Um, and the, really the only paths that were kind of taught in school would be, um, you know, business, doctor, lawyer. It was always like that sort of deal. Like that's what you're pushed towards. Be, be that. That's, that's the version of society that we want. And, um, there really was never any classes uh, that were taught that, you know, you couldn't get into an agriculture class. You, there wasn't a gardening class. There was nothing like that. And it kind of, it stinks. I mean, there, there really should, there is a lack of education. And I think a lot more people would be into it if they were able to just do it. And they're really not able to do it. They don't see it in their young life. Like, it might as well be another planet where we grow our food. <laughs> when, when we grow up in like urban and suburban areas, we just think, oh, it's it's out, you know, on a farm somewhere. And we just think of that as like middle of nowhere, USA or wherever. Um, and so it's just, we're so removed from it. And we really could use like this sort of education on it where we're just like, oh, we're going to get back into this. We're going to actually like cultivate this in young people. And I think a lot, there are a lot of schools that are doing that, but not enough. It really should be kind of a point of focus. Yeah, I, I think um, out West, maybe the attitude is a little different in terms of like know-how and education, because that's where um, a big growing community is. Uh, but coming from the East, all three of us are from the Northeast, very close in proximity. It does seem like that there is this, I'm trying to think of the word, sorry. It's only, it's like you said, it's like this like detachment of like typically where I'm from, Haddon Heights, um, very suburban town. You go to your grocery store and you just see the fruit lined up. And a lot of times it's the nicest looking fruit. I mean, because that's all that they normally take. They don't want, and even if it's a good piece of fruit or vegetable, anything, um, it has to look pleasing. And that's kind of shift, like change, like that, that like it's, um, it's, um, oh my gosh. It's a kind of like a training method almost, or like you're being, um, you're getting used to the like people get used to the fact that oh food should look like this uh mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if they like if they grow their own food and they see that the say for instance the tomato the tomato might have some spots um or if they're growing peppers the pepper might look kind of funky and they're like ew like this isn't what it looks like in the grocery store and that kind of can deter people <laughs> away from maybe buying or i'm sorry like growing their own food because they might also think that they're doing it wrong um mm -hmm. or just the grocery stores wasting food so yeah so it's just it seems like that there's this almost attachment of um how we want to eat and grow our own food for sure yeah isn't there that one yeah and i'm starting to see order like fruit that, that looks like 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 defective i guess you could say that's that's what i was going to bring up uh there's more recently i've been seeing a lot of people actually order from there it's called misfits i think like misfits market or something like that um there's several companies like that that actually like uh contract to get the stuff that doesn't look so good from farmers, which is all they're able to sell because people are so um, kind of pretentious with what they'll buy because they're so trained, just like Rob was saying, uh, to like see food as like a very particular aesthetic to it. So um, yeah, I've been seeing a lot of companies pop up that, that gets the uglier stuff from farmers, the stuff that doesn't look so good, but just tastes the same, you know? And 
get that out to people. So that's pretty cool. I'm looking at the Misfits market on the internet right now. It looks really neat. It looks like they have a uh, yeah. They have some avocados you can get 50% off, 67% off organic Valencia oranges. You know, I can imagine like a lot of the organic producers, especially, have like a lot of these you know fruits and vegetables because obviously they you know can't spray poisons on their their plants. So you know, bug comes along, takes a bite. Whoops! It's a you know misfit, you know zucchini now. Right. Yeah. And a lot of people using like old you know heirloom seeds. They're not going to get this perfectly G, you know GMO <laughs> round tomato. You know, they're, they're going to get something that's kind of ugly and misshapen you know, sometimes. Speaking, but. Of, speaking of GMO, Ian, I, I would like to know, suppose there was a tomato, right? Or at least some kind of vegetable, some innocuous vegetable where if I told you it was the most nutritious vegetable on the face of the earth, but it was made through, through GMO processes, would you still be cool with it? Would mm. you still feel good about eating it? I'm talking like highest vitamin A level you can get. It's like healthier than spinach and kale. What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I would be cool with it. Um, I mean, I don't know. You're talking to a guy that's eating freezer food, you know, his whole <laughs> life. So uh, <laughs> I, think I, would, I think I would probably be okay with it. But um, yeah. I'm kind of in like the same camp with that. I just wish that there was more GMO like towards like making things more nu nutritious. Like, isn't there the one uh, rice that they have? It's called like golden rice or something like that. It's supposed to have more vitamin A for people. And it's like super important in certain parts of the world. I think they already have stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I have heard of, of things like that. It Sometimes it does lean towards a more beneficial for the consumer. Um, type modification you know and i think that's important and i think a lot of the science suggests that there's really no issue with that at all um i think people get a little freaked out got a little freaked out by it but um yeah i think gmos largely are a good thing i think it's just when farmers kind of modify things just so that they can mass produce and make more profit that's what i have more of an issue with when it's just like um, I don't know, bastardizing something just for profit. Yeah, it seems like that farmers or the companies that supply the farmers really are making these products that, like you said, might make yield or output um, more efficient than previously. But in return, it seems almost short term in terms that it's killing off, uh, especially like the fungicides and pesticides and all those different killicides, they, um, they kill off the biology and not just the ones that they're targeting, but they tend to have this butterfly and effect of killing off beneficial organisms and um, just beneficial anything that goes well with the plant. And I feel like GMOs, can have similar consequences. It's almost like CRISPR too, where we're playing with things that, you know, like are just really beyond us, truly. And but what's cool is we are learning, but there's like a learning curve to it, and we have to be careful about the consequences that come because mistakes will happen and I think that willy nilly going all for GMO or all fungicide is just limited in turn as a view and in terms of sustainability because, um, again, if a major mistake happens and say the GMO was modified, um, not necessarily like in a malicious intent or had a malicious effect, it will have extreme vast consequences to how we eat <laughs> and that's not good yeah. so yeah yeah you raise a good point there i mean uh what's i don't really know how this came to be but there's that fact that we all know that all the bananas are the same now so if a disease happens to actually affect bananas um then 
you know, they're all going to be wiped out because there's only, there's no genetic diversity there. It's, they're all the same. They're all the exact same. So we could lose bananas in that way, which is really, you know, sad and scary to think about. But there are probably a lot of parallels to something like that with GMOs. For sure. And the worst part to think about, in my opinion, is that humans have a tendency to react be reactive rather than proactive so we'll get upset when we lose our bananas and we'll complain about why we how we should have stopped it but you know the moments now and um i'm sure there are not knocking anyone but um because there are definitely people working on the problems and i don't think most people have any malicious intent but regardless um it does seem to be hindsight very 2020 when bad things happen as it always is with people <laughs> you know i would also love to know how can you get like three pounds of bananas for like a dollar fifty don't they come from costa rica or something like that yeah they come they don't come how, from how does wild. that happen where you yeah. can get that much food so far and it's a like 50 cents a pounders or something like that? yeah I, I have no idea i thought the same thing to myself because you know, nowadays I'm always just buying the organic ones and you'll get, you know, two pounds of them or whatever. And it's so cheap. It's just astronomically cheap compared to everything else, you know, that's going up right now. I feel like everything, all the prices are rising, but bananas just seem to stay really low. It's pretty crazy. Do you think that the organic bananas taste worse than the conventional ones? That's something that, that that I think, and I would I would love to know what does everyone else think about that. I think I'll validate you a little bit on that. I think they do. Yeah. I also wonder why the heck that is. That's very strange. I always find that they're like kind of more bland, and like never get as ripe as like the the conventionally grown ones do. Maybe that's like the ethylene or whatever they're they're pumping in the truck. Maybe they're like not allowed to. Uh, pump it into the organic ones potentially you know um, i've yeah. never looked in i've never like tried to tell the difference excuse me between <laughs> an organic banana and a conventionally grown one that's um, it we're doing banana shootout with you you're gonna i eat, am i have to do both it both kinds on the air <laughs> we'll have to do a blind taste test a blind taste test we'll do yeah. it We'll do it and make good content out of it. But um, I'm gonna figure out how to make a meme of you eating those bananas, Rob. <laughs> I don't know if I want myself hit with that meme. Hey guys, it's Rob here. Sorry for the abrupt ending. It's been a bout of bad luck these past two episodes that we've lost footage at the very end. I just want to say sorry to Ian from Garden State Composting. Make sure to go give him a follow. I'll link him in the description. Go check it out if you're in the area. Thank you again so much for listening. This is the AgriGrand Podcast. Like, share, comment, subscribe. I hope to see you next episode. Happy gardening.